Hey Health Junkies, it's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about the inflammatory reflux and how it can make you fat and sick. That sounds terrible. So this inflammatory reflex is a reflex, much like if you put your hand on a hot stove and your arm, you know, you kind of pull your arm away in a reflex. This is very similar to that, except it's happening internally, something you can't really see. However, it is a cool reflex because it's sensing infection, injury to tissues, and inflammation within the body, and it's going to relay this information to the brain, and that brain of yours is going to send a message back down to the affected areas that said they have either an infection, an injury, or something of that nature, and it's going to figure out what to do. Now, the cool part about it is is that it's a protective mechanism to help protect you from invaders. But unfortunately, this inflammatory reflex can become out of whack, and it over inflames areas that do not need it after the invader has been cleared. So this is a big area in terms of research, and it's also a really big area that I've started to dive into in terms of the connection of why folks who are stressed can't seem to stop eating. And this inflammatory reflex has something to do with it. And so the inflammatory reflex was coined by a neurosurgeon back in 1998. This fellow, Dr. Kevin Tracy, he wanted to assess the connection between the vagus nerve and the immune system. So he took a rat and he put the rat under anesthesia and he was given the rat one second nerve impulses to the vagus nerve. And then he sewed the rat back up, let the rat come back too, and then he so kindly introduced the rat to a bacterial toxin because he wanted to see the promotion of something called tumor necrosis factor, which is an inflammatory cytokine. And he wanted to see the inflammatory reaction that ensued after that was produced. And instead of seeing a huge, crazy infection, he actually saw that the infection was reduced by 75%. So what he decided from this research was that, holy cow, the vagus nerve, when stimulated properly, can attenuate or regulate the amount of inflammation that the body creates. So we can use the vagus nerve to help ourselves to not overinflame. So this could be useful in the case of autoimmune conditions. It can be useful in the case of mood disorders. Depression in particular has been linked to high amounts of inflammatory cytokines in the brain. This can also be useful for obesity. And today I'm going to kind of dive into a lot of these and talk about how this all plays out. Now, in the intestine, we have this receptor And it is a nicotinic type of receptor. And every time I say a nicotinic receptor, I always think of nicotine and going, why do we have so many receptors that go along with nicotine? I don't think it's because we're meant to smoke by any means, but it just happens that there's a coincidental connection there. And I'm sure that I could do a whole podcast on that connection. But today, we're sticking with the fact that it happens to be a nicotinic receptor, but it is going to help with acetylcholine production. And acetylcholine is what we need to trigger white blood cells to take action. Now, with acetylcholine triggers, it's going to be hopefully the reaction of regulator T cells, so white blood cells that are going to regulate the immune system instead of letting it go crazy and produce all kinds of inflammation producing chemical signals. So just like I mentioned before about reflexes, just like the one where your hand touches a hot stove and you quickly pull your hand away, that is a evolutionary reflex. And the inflammation reflex is as well. So these are very, very antiquated old school, if you will, reflexes that we have in our bodies to protect ourselves. Even simple 
creatures like nematodes. Boy, I said that funny. Nematodes. We used to research those a ton when I was an undergraduate working with biology stuff. And nematodes are very simple organisms. They have very simple nervous systems, and that's why we research them. But even those guys have an inflammation reflex, so the inflammatory reflex. So since the inflammatory reflex uses the vagus nerve to send messages, the amount of signaling present in the system is what keeps the system in check. So for example, the more signaling that is going out, so your, let's, let's go with your gut, your gut's inflamed. The more messages going from your vagus nerve to your brain saying something's wrong in the gut, something's wrong in the gut, the more that the brain's going to see these messages as redundant. And so we're not going to have that message coming back from the brain to the gut via the vagus nerve saying calm that inflammation response down. We lose that. So the inflammation response goes wild. Now I'm going to tell you a little story. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf. So my husband is always messing with me about something's chasing me when we're out in the woods or something's behind me, there's a cougar, there's a bear, whatever it may be. He's done this so much to me that we had an incident in our most recent trip to Canada while we were mountain biking that I ignored his, his hollering at me that there was a grouse that was trying to bite my foot. And lo and behold, he's up ahead of me a little bit and looking back saying, the bird's going to get you. That bird's going to get you. Well, I'm so used to him teasing me that I just was like, the bird isn't going to get me, whatever. Well, guess what? The bird went after my foot. And, you know, it's not fair. We're on a big uphill and the stupid bird goes after me. I basically had to pedal harder to get away from that sucker. And thank goodness I had my biking shoes on, my clip-ins, because they're a little bit harder on the surface. So he didn't get anything. <laughs> but the point being about this story is that your inflammation arc or inflammatory reflex arc there's many words for this. I should probably keep it simple. But the inflammation reflex or inflammatory reflex is a reaction in which your body is going to naturally respond to inflammation and go, okay, we've got something going on. And then the message coming back down is going to kind of shut it down, not let it go out of control. Granted, our body is going to create some inflammation if we have a legitimate wound. But unfortunately, if our gut, let's say, is putting off a lot of signals to the brain, the brain's going to be much, much like me with my husband and his teasing about animals chasing me. And guess what? That message back down from the brain to the gut is not going to shut down the inflammatory response. So inflammation is going to go wild. And so that being said, now I'm going to be paying attention because the bird getting me was much like a stimulation to my vagus nerve in more ways than one. Now I'm afraid of those kind of birds. So I'll be looking out for them now. I'm scarred for life. So let's go a little bit more into this vagus nerve and, and how it has set points. In particular, it has a set point for our heart rate. And looking at your heart rate is one way to assess how strong your vagus nerve is or how good your vagus nerve tone is. And by that, I mean, how well is it at being able to adjust to different signals? Is it overloaded or is it not overloaded and it responds appropriately? So heart rate variability is the way to assess that. There's devices that you can put on your finger that can measure your heart rate variability. And in particular, I talked all about that quite a while ago, and it was episode 73, I believe. I'm going to verify myself. Yep, episode 73. So if you're wanting to learn a little bit more about heart rate variability, go to episode 73. I talk all about it in great detail. Today, I'm just going to mention that your heart rate, if you are scared or something alerts you or, or you witness a gruesome accident, for example, the ability for your heart rate to go down to your set point from that alerted, excited point is the basis for the health of 
your vagus nerve tone. I work with a lot of firefighters in my practice, and one of the big deals with these folks I'm always asking is how well do you come off of a call? How well, you know, how long does it take for your heart rate to stabilize after you've seen something pretty horrific? And those whose heart rate stays elevated for quite some time, now we know that their vagus nerve is not going to be in good health. We need to work on that because if the vagus nerve is not in good health, you're going to have more inflammation in your body. Now, heart rate's one way, blood pressure's your other. And so we have baroreflexes, and these are essentially a message that goes from the inside of your artery, and in particular your aorta. So this is kind of right when the blood's going from your left ventricle being pumped out into your aorta. It's going to sense right then and there, how high is the blood pressure? Are things okay? And that message is going to go via the vagus nerve up to your brain, and then your brain is going to send messages back down as to what to do about it. Do we need to dilate the capillaries? Do we need to relax the smooth muscle of the arteries a little bit? Or do we need to stiffen it up because and tighten it up because we have a lower blood pressure? So these kind of things are other connections just for me to kind of help you to identify all of the different aspects that the vagus nerve has in terms of regulation in our body. So if your reflex is not working in terms of your set points for your heart rate and your set points for your blood pressure, then you're going to have elevated blood pressure or heart rate for longer. So something to think about there. So I kind of went right into the inflammatory reflex and jumped over the main nerve that is in control of it and what it actually does. So if you haven't heard of it before, the vagus nerve is the main contributor contributor of the parasympathetic nervous system. Its function is to bring information from your gut, from your liver, from your heart, and from your lungs to your brain. So essentially, your organs are a big source of information for your brain. Your organs are going to tell your brain what's going on internally, and then your brain gets to decide what's going to happen. And because we have this reflex, sometimes we can bypass bypass the brain and just go, oops, something's going on in the gut, boom, shut it down. Shut it down, don't let it get too crazy. So let's talk a little bit more about this concept of the vagus nerve and its effect on the gut. In particular, the vagus nerve has a lot to do with digestion. It has a lot to do with your ability to sense how much food you've had in your stomach, so your sensation of fullness, but also your sensation of hunger. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit in terms of how these can become off so easily with the vagus nerve and lead to increased weight gain and obesity eventually. Now, the vagus nerve also is in charge of your respiratory rate, so how fast you're breathing. It's also in charge of coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and vomiting. When I used to teach anatomy and physiology, I always made the joke of what happens in Vegas doesn't always stay in Vegas. If you're hungover, you're on a plane, and uh, things come back up. So there you have it. Now, if we look at how messages from the vagus nerve get up to the brain, and in terms of distribution, Check this out. You've got 90% of the vagus nerve fibers are dedicated to messages going to the brain, whereas only 10% of the messages of the vagus nerve, so fibers of of the vagus nerve, are coming out of the brain. So just to be geeky for a second, because I might use these terms, and I'm going to try not to, but in case I do, afferent are the nerves that are going to the brain, and efferent are the nerves coming out of the brain. So those are kind of the technical terms, if you will, when we start getting talking about messages in and out of the brain. So what does that tell us? If there's 90% of the vagus nerve fibers are dedicated to taking messages from the body to the brain, that means that vagus nerves are monitoring nerve. It's like surveillance in the body. So there you have it. Now, the vagus nerve is going to play a lot in terms of hunger, fullness, and energy metabolism. It's also going to have a lot to do with gastric acid secretion, digestive enzymes, and the amount that you can actually put into your stomach. Now, messages going from the body into the brain are messages of irritation, inflammation on the gut lining, messages of hunger, fullness, and then what's happening with energy metabolism. Now, the messages out 
are, oh, we have food. We need to create some stomach acid. Oh, we have food getting from the stomach into the intestines. We need some digestive enzymes. Oh, we have food in the stomach. How full is the stomach? Now, these are all messages coming out to kind of attenuate what's going on in the whole process of digestion. So now you can see there's a lot going on in that case and why the more stressed you may become, the more deranged the vagus nerve may become, the, the more difficult it is to la- lose weight and deal with managing your hunger and your fullness. So in terms of the vagus nerve, some of the little nitty gritty things, and the reason I'm going to mention this in terms of its functions is because I think it's really important for folks to understand what kind of symptoms you might be experiencing if your vagus nerve is not functioning like it should. So muscles of the pharynx and larynx, so this is your throat and your voice box area. So if you're having difficulty with swallowing, difficulty with speaking, there might be some issues there with your vagus nerve, which, by the way, it's cranial nerve 10, so it's one of your cranial nerves, your basic functioning nerves in your body. Now, because that vagus nerve is also working on your breathing and contraction relaxation of your diaphragm, well, if you're taking super short breaths and not taking deep breaths and relaxing, you might be messing with the ability of your vagus nerve to function properly. So this is why breathing techniques are super important and why yoga is quite possibly one of the best things in addition to other types of meditation and whatnot to help you with attenuating and regulating your vagus nerve. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the intestines a little bit with the vagus nerve because I think this is kind of interesting but also something to feed back to if you're stressed x y or z might happen. So the vagus nerve regulates the contraction of your smooth muscles of your intestines. It also regulates glandular secretion, so mucosal types of secretion, so mucus to help slide things through, protect your gut layer. Now, also, you have quite a bit of branching, if you will, going to certain parts of your digestive system. So you've got your stomach, you've got all of your intestines covered from certain branches of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve has different types of receptors. So mechanoreceptors that respond to stretch, chemoreceptors that respond to certain chemicals, so hormones, things of that nature. And then we also have certain types of tension receptors. And these guys are even in the esophagus, which I didn't, didn't mention before as part of the picture, but you, essentially your whole digestive system is connected to the vagus nerve, as is your liver and pancreas. So all of digestion can be affected by the vagus nerve not working properly or being irritated by certain things like frankenfoods, too much alcohol, even environmental toxins that you might be inhaling and getting into your digestive system. It's a big deal. The other big thing to think about here is that if you have trouble with constipation, or diarrhea. So it could be IBS, or it could be you have constipation, or you have diarrhea, or sometimes you have certain episodes depending on stress related incidents, or travel constipation, period related constipation or diarrhea in ladies. These things are vagus nerve issues. This is a sign that your vagus nerve is not as strong and resilient as it should be. Things you want to work on maybe paying a little bit more attention to how much time you're chilling out and having fun versus staying up late to catch up on some work that you need to get done. It'll be there tomorrow. Really? Okay. So let's talk about digestion again because I think it's really important to get to the nitty gritty here and I'm going to get into some of the hormones and the signaling mechanisms that are thrown off when your vagus nerve has become out of whack. Now, I already mentioned how many receptors are along your digestive system, essentially from the esophagus all the way down to your colon. Your vagus nerve is really going to be there to take note of what you've digested. 
It's not going to tell in terms of what's in the stomach. Really what happens in the stomach is we're looking at sheer volume of what goes into the stomach. Once things get into the intestines, that's when your vagus nerve is going to assess, oh, do they have more protein, so peptides and amino acids, or do we have more fats or short-chain fatty acids? It's going to assess all that. And how's it going to do that? Via chemical signaling. It's pretty intelligent, and it's a pretty intelligent system. It's also going to determine what's going to be absorbed, what's going to be stored, and what's going to get mobilized in that moment. And this all happens between messages from the vagus nerve that's acting in the stomach and in the intestines. It's going to go up to the brain, and then the messages back down are going to tell the stomach, okay, what do we need to do now? And it's also going to tell the intestines what to do. Because absorption happens in the intestines, this is where things are going to be absorbed. Then from the intestines, we're going to have the storage and mobilization effect happening. It's pretty cool. Now, in the stomach, I need to mention that alcohol, aspirin, and water are absorbed through the stomach. So those are the three things that would end up signaling the vagus nerve as to next steps on that aspect. But everything else goes through the intestines. So the main signaling hormone of the digestive system is cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin regulates basically every GI function. It triggers pancreatic juices, so your pancreatic enzymes. It is going to trigger the release of stomach acid secretion. It's also going to help with contraction of the gallbladder, if you still have one, to help you to digest fat. And it's also going to help with the gastric emptying. So all of things that need to happen for proper digestion. Now, if you just think about that for a moment, it's very common that a lot of people actually don't produce enough stomach acid and don't produce enough digestive enzymes out of the pancreas. Why does that happen? Those are signs that your vagus nerve is not working properly. So keep that in mind. Now, cholecystokinin can activate the vagus nerve in the brain and in something known as the myenteric plexus, which is more or less your nervous system network. It's like its big name for what's happening in the gut. All of the nerves that go to the two layers of muscle are innervated by the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, can have action on your smooth muscle of your gut. So... As a side note, just something to mention, because cholecystokinin is in charge of all of the functions of the gut, and I said it has a big regulating activity function in the gut, it also has been linked in high quantities to anxiety. So if you have more cholecystokinin in your body, you have more anxiety. The tendency for a lot of folks with anxiety is to have diarrhea as well. Some food intake what it's going to do is going to inhibit the firing of the messages from the vagus nerve coming in. And what it's going to do is going to suppress your insulin release. So it's going to basically tell you that you are hungry. Interestingly enough, folks who have insulin resistance will also have issues with ghrelin. And since ghrelin suppresses insulin, and ghrelin is in charge of telling you you're hungry, you can see that now you have a double trouble. You're hungry and you're not able to utilize carbohydrates for energy effectively. What happens? Weight gain. Not good. Now, leptin is a hormone that is going to give you the message that you are full. You want more leptin in your system if you're struggling with having trouble to be full. And a lot of times it ends up breaking down to having to train your body a little bit better and working on your vagus nerve function to get that signaling back. And it takes time and a lot of frustration, which is why later on today in the podcast, I'm going to be talking about some folks who are looking at bioelectric implantable devices that can stimulate the vagus nerve to help you get back your sensation of fullness and hunger because unfortunately, a lot of folks have lost their way in that department. I'll be honest that with some really hard work, you can get those back. It also involves working on your vagus nerve as a whole. And for some people, it might be worth it to look into the electro-stim devices that can be implanted to just help you get over the hump. 
and they're not permanent, by the way. So we'll talk about those in a little bit. Now, when someone is having trouble with hormone regulation, we're going to see signs, right? I already mentioned we're going to be gaining weight. We're going to have obesity. We're going to have the overwhelming need to just keep eating. And I hear this from a lot of folks that I just can't get full. I'm always hungry. I can't figure it out. Well, unfortunately, what happens is when we have those signals, then we eat more. And unbeknownst to us over time, unfortunately, it happens that we've trained ourselves to eat more. Now, with training ourselves to eat more, eventually we lose the signaling because that vagus nerve gets tired of seeing all of the frequent episodes of eating. It's just like, oh, man, not again. You just ate like five minutes ago. And so these messages are getting old. It's kind of like the boy who cried wolf or my husband who kept telling me that there was animals following me. It's, it gets sick of the messaging and it just starts to ignore things. So there is some points to retraining yourself, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end of the podcast. So how do we go about regulating inflammation in the vagus nerve? Well, there's a couple different ways to work on it. And in particular, we have to understand the mechanism. What is actually happening here? So the vagus nerve responds to increasing circulating amounts of something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. It's a cytokine. And what'll happen is the vagus nerve is gonna go, oh, there's some inflammation happening in the body. Then that message is gonna go up to the brain and the brain's gonna say, oh yeah, inflammation, shut it down. Message down is going to be to stop the production of tumor necrosis factor. That's the main job of the vagus nerve. It's to shut down inflammation when the bodies become overactive in certain areas and there's been damage. Now you can see this could be a big issue in someone who has food sensitivities or someone that has IBS or IBD, so irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease. Working on the vagus nerve can hugely affect these conditions in a positive manner. Crohn's disease, also another one that is linked in this case. So how do we actually attenuate the vagus nerve reaction here? How do we get the vagus nerve to shut down the production of so much tumor necrosis factor alpha, the cytokine that we don't want to elevate it in the body? Well, we use actually the splenic nerve, so your nerve that goes to your spleen. And most of us know that the spleen has a lot of immune cells, in particular white blood cells. It does have red blood cells as well. And these spleen immune cells are are going to be carrying receptors, and they can communicate with the immune and our nervous system. So they can respond to norepinephrine. This would be your fight or flight, your adrenaline type of hormone. But it can also respond to acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter that can help with muscle contraction, but it can also help with just getting things done, as I call it. It's a promoter neurotransmitter. So in the case of the immune cells in the spleen, what we're wanting to happen is we're wanting to stimulate those white blood cells to act to call over T cells. And we want T regulator cells. Think of these guys as the bouncers. You want the bouncers to regulate what's going on in the area and go, all right, we don't want the cytokine riffraff. Get them out of here. We're stopping this. We're going to work with positive positive connections. We're going to stop inflaming the body. So in this case, what ends up happening is that your spleen can actually help you, in addition to your white blood cells, to regulate inflammation in your body in a positive manner, thanks to the vagus nerve. So how many of you knew that before listening to this podcast, that your vagus nerve works with your spleen? Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, what if I don't have a spleen? Oh, that's it. (laughs) No. What happens is that your vagus nerve is going to act on other white blood cells known as macrophages. These guys are like your janitor cells that go around and survey kind of what's going on in the body and clean up any damage or clean up any excess debris from 
inflammatory processes. So what you're going to be relying on in your case if you don't have a spleen is you're going to be relying on your white blood cells to be super strong to call over the bouncer T regulator cells versus going down a different pathway that actually promotes more inflammation. And the way to keep that in check is to keep your body as chill as possible, but also to reduce any possible exogenous, so outside sources of inflammation. So stopping eating crappy food. Don't drink too much. Don't stress yourself out. You might be thinking, gosh, easier said than done. Well, there are steps that you can take to keep your body at a minimal inflammation level. And it's not that hard. It's just simple things, and a lot of it has to do with drinking water, breathing, eating good food, and taking time to have fun. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what exactly is going on in terms of weight. Why does a deranged vagus nerve cause you to gain weight? And why is it so hard for people to lose weight? And why is it so much of a problem this day and age? Well, unfortunately, as I mentioned before, it's because we've been eating too many calories for too long, overeating for too long, and eating too frequently. And this really does confuse the vagus nerve. With so many different fad diets out there, I don't know how a lot of people manage (laughs) because even myself with trying to listen to all the hype out there of calories don't really matter, what's in and out doesn't really matter, it's the quality of the food. Okay, yeah, that's true. But there is something to quantity. There's absolutely something to quantity. Maybe you don't have to count calories, but there is something to every single person's quantity and every single person's tolerance of certain macros. Like I've mentioned before, we all have a carbohydrate tolerance. We also all have a tolerance of how much food our stomach and our vagus nerve can tolerate. We wouldn't have things like gastric bypass surgeries and lap band surgeries if they weren't effective. They're shutting down the amount of food that you can put in your body. Because yes, as we eat over and over again, we can stretch our stomach. And as we drink too many fluids, that's another thing that I find for some people, it's really the amount of fluid that they're drinking with a meal that can cause some issues for them. So something to think about there. Now, As mentioned, the disruption of the vagus nerve input is sufficient to drive you to overeat and become obese. And it's all related to by overeating, you're stretching your receptors of your stomach too much, too frequently, and that causes reduced sensitivity by your vagus nerve. And then we end up with reduced production of hormones that tell us we're full. I can absolutely say that I've paid attention enough to myself that this happens. And it happens in sequences. You can absolutely dial in and figure out hunger and fullness if you pay attention to quantities of food over time. And you really become strict with pulling back on the amount that you're eating. For some people, it's learning how to stop eating when you're about 80% full. And some people do really well with that. But if you don't even know your signals, that's not even a work for you. You have to take away some food, which might seem super scary at first for a lot of folks. And it's a matter of not thinking of it as you're restricting. And I'll be full, fully honest that I've worked with this a lot with myself and others because of having eating disorder tendencies We have to be careful, especially myself, in terms of telling myself I'm going to restrict my calories. I'm going to restrict the amount of food. No, I'm not restricting the amount of food. I'm actually trying to protect my vagus nerve from becoming overstimulated. I can see the difference from when I say go on vacation and eat more foods and then come back and try to reduce the amount of food. I bet a lot of other folks have seen this happen to themselves. Especially if you go on like a cruise, my goodness, it's like gastric lavage there. You're like eating all the time, food all the time, and it 
goodness. But you can tell, right? You know that you've spent a week of eating a ton of food, and then now you're like, holy cow, I feel like I need to eat eight times what I normally eat because I've just trained myself to eat more. So the point I'm trying to make is that you can train yourself to eat less. Now, leptin resistance, meaning your body cannot tell you when you're full, is often present even in early obesity. And then that's going to coincide with eating more. So it's almost like your body just unfortunately creates a vicious cycle for you. Because if you already can't tell when you're full, and then now you're going to start eating more, and it happens just when you start to gain weight, and it just explodes from there, it's just not fair. It just really isn't. But I'm here to say that you can do this, and you can pay attention, and baby steps, just watching how things go, and talking to yourself that, look, you're not restricting food. You're actually working to find out how much your stomach can tolerate and how much it should. Because if we go back to what helps us with longevity, having a good solid vagus nerve that works properly and is not being overloaded in the gut, you want great gut function, you want great liver function, if the liver and the gut aren't working, you're not going to have longevity. So if you're looking to live to 105 or more like me, you've got to figure out what your gut can tolerate and make sure you're not overloading it. Because any little component that's going to mess with the vagus nerve is going to create excess inflammation in the body. Now, I know that there's other issues in the gut, such as gut bugs like yeast or bacterial overgrowth or viruses and et cetera, that can contribute to the inflammatory picture that you already have. So if you have those bugs growing and then on top of that, you're eating too much and now you're causing leaky gut, this is a big deal. This is a lot of inflammation for your body. And as I've mentioned over and over again in previous podcasts, if you have leaky gut, you're going to have molecules of food getting into your bloodstream and you're having autoimmune attacks happening. And it's just a matter of time before your vagus nerve can't regulate those either. So big deal to pay attention to how much you're eating and really hone in on am I full, when am I hungry, and really planning it out with your body to see when do you have hunger, when do you feel full. I love intermittent fasting for the fact that for a lot of people, it's the first time they've felt hunger in forever. And some people, it takes a while. Some people, it's amazing that they could go for a whole day and not feel hungry, and it disturbs them. But it's, it's part of the way of learning what hunger feels like and then when you eat, what feeling full feels like. Now, keep in mind, anyone that has extreme fatigue or anyone that has thyroid issues, I don't recommend going over 14 hours of fasting from dinner to breakfast. Just keep that in mind as a caveat. Your metabolism is going to have a hard time with that. So what if you taught yourself to eat less and less often? Does it scare you? It was scary to me a while back, but now I'm starting to realize that the more that I figure it out, the easier it is. So think about it. Now, let's think about these treatments that help to regulate the vagus nerve and inflammation for a moment. I've worked in this realm of trying to adjust the vagus nerve for a long time. And I've worked quite a bit with something called the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is part of the fight or flight system. The vagus nerve is also part of the fight or flight system, but it's working a little bit on a different pathway. And sometimes when I use a lot of herbs to calm the nervous system working on the HPA axis, but I'm not getting results with folks, I do turn to the vagus nerve. So if you're out there and you've been trying a lot of different adaptogenic herbs, you know, maybe you've tried HPA Access Reset, the product by Gaia Herbs that I recommend, or Adrenal Health by Gaia Herbs, or any of the products out there that are adrenal adaptogens, such as holy basil, such as ashwagandha, Siberian ginseng, any of those different things, and you're just like, I don't feel any calmer, I don't feel any better, it's probably because we need to put your focus a little bit more towards the vagus nerve. So there are devices such as vagus nerve stimulators. I actually have a patient with one. She has it because of epilepsy, but the off-label use per se is also used to help folks with 
losing weight. I have found that to be effective for some other folks and definitely looking in research. My patient in particular that has the stimulator now definitely is not overweight and noted that she lost weight when she had the stimulating device put in. Now, there's the Dr. Tracy who coined the term inflammatory reflex, and he has a company called Setpoint Medical. He is working on a rechargeable battery device that can be implanted temporarily and can be monitored and reset via an iPad. How cool is that? And really what he's doing there with this device is helping folks to adjust their vagus nerve signaling. And in particular, it is for helping folks to lose weight and re-fire properly in terms of hunger and fullness. It's not out on the market yet. You can check him out at setpointmedical.com. It's pretty cool. I am interested when this comes out to see more data, but the data so far in terms of preliminary research on devices such as his has shown that folks do lose weight because they're getting stimulus to the vagus nerve that had basically that pathway had shut down because it was overloaded. So it's kind of cool. We're reviving the vagus nerve. Now, there are other things you can do to work on that vagus nerve. And in particular, barring going as far as setting in a device, I actually think that Looking at your heart rate variability helps quite a bit because it's another mechanism that you can see, oh, this is what's going on with my body. My my vagus nerve isn't in check today. There's a device called the WHOOP that's pretty popular with a lot of athletes that will look at heart rate variability based on should you work out today or should you do a rest day or should you do a light day. And I think that's pretty cool because for a lot of athletes, they really struggle to know, you know, when to take a break and when to go full speed. And the same applies to a lot of folks who aren't athletes, but let's put it this way, are go-getters and conquer the world kind of folks who just are all about their careers or their children and anybody but themselves and they go, go, go and they do, do, do. I think the heart rate variability is a great way to assess that. And go over to my episode 73 and check out all on how to use the device. But I do think that assessing heart rate variability is really good in that case. There's also some apps on your iPhones and things that look at that. So there's lots of different connections. There's the iWatch one as well. But having that as a baseline to know how off is your vagus nerve will tell you, okay, this is when you need to take a break. This is when you need to chill so that your vagus nerve does not become so wildly out of range. The other biggie is taking a moment to look at how is your liver? How is your gut? A lot of people will go, how, how would I even know how my liver is? Well, are your liver enzymes up? Do you have difficulty dealing with chemicals? What happens if you drink alcohol? Do you get sick pretty quick? Now, if you've always been sick with it, you might be a quick converter to aldehyde, but maybe you're developing an intolerance to alcohol. That means your liver's bogged down. Same thing goes with if you're cleaning your house with certain chemicals, you haven't switched over to good chemicals or, <laughs> or things that are healthy for you and the, na- the environment and nature, then you might want to be thinking about that because that's going to bog down your liver as well. And you know your environmental exposures to that's biggie. What's going on with your blood pressure? What's going on with your heart rate? What's going on with your lungs? Are they healthy? Are you breathing okay? These are big things to think about. What's going on with mood? Because depression is a huge red flag that something's up with your vagus nerve, as is anxiety. Chronic PTSD, multiple traumas in life that compound, whether there are big episodes or little things that add up over time, these are things that are going to set your vagus nerve off. Now, the big signaler for the vagus nerve is acetylcholine. And sometimes folks can be deficient in the precursors to acetylcholine. Choline is the amino acid that is crucial for creating acetylcholine. Eggs, meats, fish, and whole grains are foods that are rich in choline. So a lot of times I will worry about my vegans who are also not eating any whole grains. 
there's pretty much not much choline in that diet, and that's not a good thing. Now, there are supplements to increase choline. It's called alpha-GPC in particular. Hooperzine A, Bacopa, those guys help to increase your choline. Caffeine does as well, which makes sense, right? We use caffeine for a pre-workout to get our muscles firing, you know, and get in there and hit it hard. But a lot of people use caffeine as nature's laxative. And that's because caffeine has an effect on your smooth muscles in your gut. How does it do that? Because of acetylcholine receptors in your vagus nerve. So caffeine is helping your vagus nerve in this case do its job, but too much caffeine can be a problem. Blueberries, rosemary, cinnamon, go-to cola, holy basil, balancing your zinc and copper can also be really helpful in terms of regulating your vagus nerve and having enough acetylcholine production. I've mentioned before a product called Parasim Plus by Dr. Diana Driscoll, and that's another one to look into that also has huperzine and alpha-GPC. Disease often starts in our body when we stop having fun in life. When adulting takes over or when we have to grow up a little faster than we'd like to. So I want you guys to take a moment right now and reflect. What did you do today? Did you do what you wanted to do? Did you spend any time having fun today? Are you even in control of your time? Or have you given that up to someone else? Thing to think about. Not everyone. Important questions to assess the likelihood that your vagus nerve is out of balance. If you are not in control of your time, you didn't do what you wanted to do at least for five minutes today, and you are not having any fun, and maybe you didn't even laugh today once, not good. These are all things that help to keep your vagus nerve in check. And honestly, I truly believe that for most of us, whatever happens to us in life and how things play out, the moment that we stopped acting like a kid because someone told us that we need to grow up or we were acting immature and we lost that ability to just do something silly and smile like a true smile, I'll see. Then you add some gut bugs on top of that, some toxins building up in your environment, taking short breaths because you're stressed, not spending enough time in nature, and guess what? You're a true American. Ugh. You have true issues going on. It's not good. So we need to get you to self-soothe a little bit. Breathing's a biggie, some abdominal massage, self-abdominal massage, or if you got somebody that's willing to do it for you, even better. Getting outside, always key. Forest bathing, I'm never going to say no to that. Huge. Acupuncture, meditation, and yoga. Very biggies here. Now, if you listen to any of my podcasts before, you probably heard me say that I really suck at meditation. But I will tell you, I'm good at acupuncture, and I'm getting the yoga down. <laughs> acupuncture has a ton of research in terms of how it is great at increasing vagal tone, so making your vagus nerve stronger and getting it to work properly. I see a lot of patients in my practice who come to me regularly for a little bit for acupuncture while we're working on a certain medical condition they might have. Then they stop the acupuncture and their symptoms kind of come back or we'll see like a backslide in the progress of their results. What does that tell you? Their vagus nerve needed that acupuncture to help them to make it stronger. So I'm a huge proponent of acupuncture, not only because I do the acupuncture, but also because I really do believe that it's one of the greatest platforms for folks to come in, lay down, relax for an hour, and not have any outside distractions. They might be thinking, their mind might be making lists, but no one's bugging them. Except for me coming in and just working with their needles a little bit. I could probably do an entire podcast just on the benefits of, of acupuncture for your brain. But at this point, this one's getting long, so I'm not going to go into it. Now, there is a device that's been cleared by the FDA, but not on the market yet, that I better tell you about. It's a capsule that has citric acid and cellulose in it basically fiber and a little bit of an acid stabilizer. And you're supposed to take it before you eat, and it opens up and expands in your stomach to set off the vagus nerve receptors to release cholecystokinin, the big hormone that tells your vagus nerve that you have something in your stomach. And ultimately, this capsule is supposed to help you with the sensations of being full, so help you with triggering leptin to tell you you're full. Now, it's called Plenity. 
And you can find it at myplenity.com. And keep in mind, it's not on the market yet, but it's out there. And I find it interesting because it reminds me of those little capsules that you added water to, and then you end up with like little animals. What are they called? Like grow in water toys or something, or magic grow capsules. Anyway, it reminds me of that. And I think about that's what's happening in my stomach if I was to take one of those. My version of this, if you're not into uh, that, would be what if you ate more veggies first on your plate? And you had a little bit more veggies than your carbs in your meat or your grains in your meat on your plate. And you look to see if that helps you with feeling full faster. That way, you're working on slowly changing what's on your plate. Just a thought. Now, keep in mind, your gut, your liver, your heart, your lungs, and your brain. These are all messages that are coming in and going out from the vagus nerve. So anything that's happening in these areas is going to have an effect on the tone or strength of your vagus nerve. If you're having heart palpitations, if you have a fatty liver, if you're having trouble being sensitive to alcohol now and you weren't before, you're having gut issues, you're having trouble with your lungs and breathing, you're having trouble focusing, brain stuff, big deal here, blood-brain barrier issues. Now, in my previous podcast to this one, episodes 146 and 147, I talk about neuroinflammation. I talk about the brain and leaky blood-brain barrier and leaky gut connections. These are big. With the gut, you want to be working on those clear infections out of the gut. You want to maximize your gut microbiome balance. Do I think you absolutely always have to go test your gut microbiome? No. I think that folks could do quarterly detoxes using silver, nanosilver, or using artemisinin. I like those combos. The liver. I always recommend detoxing the liver at least a couple times a year. Milk thistle is one of the great liver detoxers. So are beets. So are cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli. The lymph. Your lymphatic system dumps into your liver. It also dumps into your heart. Something I didn't mention before. It doesn't really have signaling with the vagus nerve, but I think it's important in terms of clearing out toxins. Dry brushing. Get on top of it. Google it. It's awesome. Heart and lungs. Exercising and breathing techniques. Get on them. Brain, meditation, yoga, acupuncture, fun, laughter, blood-brain barrier healing with things like turmeric or cover three. Huge deals there. And when I say turmeric, I'm talking about curcumin, actually, the extract from turmeric. I like curcumin Avail by Designs for Health. So we've got to the end of the show. I got to give you your takeaways. And today I decided I have to have two because I couldn't decide which one I thought was better. So number one, if you do nothing else after listening to this podcast, I want you to work on breathing, taking five count inhales and seven count exhales at least 10 times during the day. Do it when you first wake up. Do it before bed. Try it or do it when you're stressed. See how it goes. I bet you will feel better. So practice that. The other biggie is if you're struggling with your weight, trying to work on the sensation of feeling full and feeling your stomach and knowing what's happening in there, I recommend trying to reduce your food intake by two tablespoons at each meal. This way, if you're struggling with issues of reducing calories or restricting yourself, it's a small amount and you're thinking about how does my stomach feel with two tablespoons less? How does this feel overall, and slowly increase it until you're at the point where you can feel, and I mean slowly decrease it, sorry, decrease the amount of food till you can feel your stomach tell you, I'm full, I'm stretching, and I don't need any more food. So play with it. Now, if you enjoyed this podcast and you know somebody that can really use this information, you advocate for your best health care ever. So giving you information on what's out there, what's the latest, and what I've seen as effective. And I definitely think the vagus nerve is something to pay attention to. Okay, you've survived another episode of The Health Fix. I hope you have a great day, whatever you're doing. And if you need resources from the show, go over to my notes at drjkrausnd.com and you'll get it all right there. All of the geeky studies that I looked at and everything else will be linked there for you. Please share it with them. That's the point of my podcast. I'm here to help you. 
Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.